Okay, so uh, when we apply triangulation to stars, we have to use the idea of parallax. And parallax can be a little bit tricky to understand, but um, luckily you can develop a little bit of physical intuition for it. You've probably noticed it before actually. So if you hold something in front of your face and then you look at it first with one eye and then the other eye, then it appears to shift back and forth in your field of vision. And the farther away that you get your finger, the smaller the shift will be. So go ahead and try that if you've never tried it. And I have a little animation on the slide to help you see why this happens. It's because our eyes are some distance apart from each other. And so they're actually viewing objects from different angles. So when we blink one eye closed, we're looking at it from only one of our detectors. And then when we blink the other eye closed, we're looking at it with the other detector. And this shift, this apparent shift against a fixed background that we see because our eyes are looking at things from different angles, that shift is called parallax. And so when we use this to measure the distance to stars, we, instead of using uh, you know, two eyes or two sensors on some side of a baseline, we just use the position of an earth at two different times when it's on one side of the sun and then when it's at the opposite edge of its orbit. And that gives us a total of a, um, well, I guess it really ends up being a one AU baseline. So um, let me show you how this works. If we look at the star from one point in our orbit, let's say we're looking at it in January, then against some background field of stars that don't appear to move, that nearby star appears in one particular location. So if we take a picture of the star in January, then we'll have some reference point. And then if we look again in July, that star will appear to have shifted on the sky. And now we will be looking at it um, you know, from a different vantage point at a different angle. So when we take the picture, the star has appeared to shift. And the amount that the star appears to shift on the sky is called the parallax shift. And it's measured in terms, not of a distance, but in terms of an angle. Because uh, thinking back to the celestial sphere, uh, there are 360 degrees around the entire sky, right? In any great circle that spans the sphere. And so when we measure distances on the sky, we always measure in terms of angle. Um, if you want a reference, then your pinky finger held at arm's length is one degree on the sky. All right, so, um, let me ask you this kind of just conceptual question about parallax. Based on what you just did with your finger in front of your face, would you say that the parallax shift is greater if a star is nearby or if it's far away? All right, I'm seeing most votes for nearby and that's exactly right. So if we have a nearby star, then the difference in angle that we'll view it at will make the parallax shift much larger than for a far away star. And this is exactly why there can be a background of stars that don't appear to shift. They could have a parallax shift, but they're so far away that their parallax shift is effectively zero. All right, so um, from this, we can understand that we can really only use the method of parallax to measure the distance to relatively nearby stars. We can't use it to measure the parallax shift of those fixed looking background stars. All right, another conceptual question. Would the parallax shift be larger if we observed from the Earth in January and July or from Mars at the different edges of its orbit? And to answer this question, I suppose you have to know that Earth is closer to the Sun than Mars. All right, there's the poll. So A, is Earth greater shift or B, is Mars the greater shift? All right, so the vote is split, but once I show you the diagram, you're going to kick yourself. So Earth is closer to the sun than Mars. And that means that the baseline is smaller. And so just like if I was scoping out my pig on the table, if I measured from a shorter distance away from point one to point two, then I would be measuring a much narrower angle. And if I measure from a larger distance, I measure a much larger angle. So the parallax shift is greater if you have a greater baseline and you would have a greater baseline if you observed from Mars than from the Earth. So there's nothing much that we can do about observing from Earth. We're kind of, I mean, for the most part, for all practical purposes, we're stuck here. Our satellites mostly orbit Earth, not Mars. And so um, we use this idea 
of always observing from Earth in order to make our lives easier with the geometry of parallax. Um, and this leads us to the idea of the unit of the parsec again. So when we, when we look at the, um, the right triangle that uh, has a baseline from Earth to the Sun, so a baseline of one astronomical unit, then we define the parsec as the distance to a star whose parallax shift on the sky is one arc second. All right, so that is the definition of the parsec. It's a little bit of an Earth-centric unit because we're defining it with respect to one astronomical unit, right? And one arc second might not be a very familiar unit of angle. Um, it, there happens to be 60 arc minutes in a degree and 60 arc seconds in, a minute, in an arc minute. And so there's 3,600 arc seconds in one degree. So again, your, your pinky finger held at arm's length is one degree on the sky. And so imagine 3,600 arc seconds across your pinky. That's a tiny, tiny shift. It's barely visible to the naked eye. Um, it's the skinny edge of a credit card as viewed from across a football field. So the most stars have a shift of less than one arc second. And so it's really hard to uh, make out that shift even with ground-based telescopes. So we have to use space-based telescopes for most of our measurements of stellar parallax. Um, okay, and it's really easy using this geometry to find the distance in parsecs. Uh, because that angle is very small, the tangent of the angle is replaced by just the angle. And so then our geometry gives us that the distance is one divided by the parallax angle. The distance in parsecs is given by one divided by the parallax angle in arc seconds. All right. So just to double check um, that, using that equation, how far away is a star if it has a parallax angle of two arc seconds? Your choices are two, one, 0.5, or 0.25. So most of you are saying, see that if my star has a parallax shift, a parallax angle of two arc seconds, then that means that its distance is 0.5 parsecs because one divided by two gives me 0.5. So that's exactly right. So this is remarkably simple um, calculation to do as long as we measure our angles in arc seconds. Um, and those are very tiny angles, like I said. And so it turns out that when we measure with ground-based telescopes, the amount of smearing out that happens because of turbulence in the air and the atmosphere means that that can't be very precisely measured with ground-based telescopes. So we have to measure from space in order to get the most accurate distance calculations. The European Space Agency has launched two satellites. The Hipparcos satellite was active from 1989 to 1993 and was able to measure out to 200 parsecs by measuring tiny parallaxes. Um, and Gaia is still active now and it measures out to 10,000 parsecs 